Good morning, everyone. And I'm, I'm pleased to see that there's a couple of people that have set up there in anticipation that maybe we will run out of space down here. I'm very pleased with that. Uh, so uh, my name is Ulrich, and I'm a PhD student at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Oxford. The work I'm going to be presenting is a grant collaboration that also involved people at the University of Washington and uh, King's College and UCLIC and at the University of Toronto. <coughs> So, many people struggle to control their use of digital devices. Whether that feels that is in terms of being distracted in context where they really shouldn't be, or whether it means sort of feeling sucked in and ending up spending longer time with their devices than they actually wanted. And for some users, the negative life impacts of this can be quite severe. Uh, for a few years, there's been a market response to this in the form of what you could call digital self-control tools, that are apps and browser extensions that tweak the functionality of people's devices in ways intended to help people exercise self-control. These tools do a lot of different things, but uh, they largely fall into four different types of clusters that I'll come back to. Um, many of them are about just blocking or removing distracting features, like blocking distracting websites or removing Facebook's newsfeed. Uh, others are about just tracking yourself and visualizing your own behavior so you can use that information to regulate yourself. Others are about uh, reminding yourself what it was that you wanted to do when you brought out your device. This is the to-do book, which uh, adds a to-do list to Facebook's newsfeed. Uh, and uh, others of them are rather about just rewarding or punishing yourself for how you spent your time. For example, in the form of chopping down a virtual tree if you leave a phone uh, during a focus session. Um, recently, uh, Apple and Google started to pick up on this trend and began to build in similar functionality into their operating systems, in the case of Apple with their screen time app and in the case of Google with their digital well-being uh, tools. Meanwhile, in HCI, uh, this sort of topic has been in focus at least since 2012, where people have begun to build similar tools and evaluate them. What we wanted to do in our work was to add to this work in two different ways. We wanted to first know what design features have actually been explored by the current digital self-control tools on the app and web stores. Because there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of natural experiments out there, so it might be illuminating for us to have a systematic overview of what areas of the design space have been explored and what sort of ideas tend to be, you know, go viral and so on. And the second thing we wanted to do was to explore how a dual systems model of self-regulation uh, lent from cognitive psychology might help us organize and ev evaluate those features. And that's because uh, these kind of models are very commonly used in psychology to think about how unconscious habits and conscious goals interact. But when we looked at the HCI uh, literature on these tools, we found that many didn't refer to any psychological frameworks at all. And among the ones that did, we didn't find anyone that actually referred to dual systems models, and we thought that this might be potentially useful. <clears throat> So what we did was that we looked at three different stores. We looked at the Google Play Store, uh, the Chrome uh, uh, Web Store for browse extensions, and the Apple App Store. And on those stores, we automatically downloaded all of the search results for the terms distraction, addiction, motivation, and self-control, uh, both on their own and in combination with smartphone and laptop. So smartphone distraction, smartphone addiction, and so on. Uh, that's left us with around 5,000 uh, distinct uh, tools. And then we narrowed down those five tools in a few different steps that you can read more about in the paper to include only those that were explicitly designed to help people self-regulate their own use of digital devices. And uh, uh, then we ended up with 367 tools that we then went on to code the functionality in. So we coded the functionality by looking at the paid store for each of these tools. And there's an example here from the Google Play Store on the left uh, with off time. And on the page stores, we looked at the videos and the screenshots, as well as the, the descriptions of these tools. And we coded the features they included in an iterative fashion, where three of us began by looking at 20 tools each and then discussed how to uh, capture the functionality they had. Then we looked at a large sample of 60 tools each and discussed, discussed again. And then finally, uh, using the final version of the codebook, I then reviewed the features in all of the, all of the tools. In the spirit of open science and open collaboration, you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash digital hyphen self-control 
and you can see exactly what this meant in practice. That will forward you to a copy of the Google Sheet in which we did the actual coding. And you can scroll through all of the, cools, uh, all of the tools and see our notes in them and so on. So please uh, feel free to use that uh, in, in your own uh, research. Okay, so before I go into what we learned from adding some psychological theory to this, let me just run over a few highlights in terms of what the tools actually do. So what design features have actually been explored by the current digital self-control tools <clears throat> on the app and web stores? Excuse me. Um, so this is a slightly busy plot of uh, the percentage of tools that included the most sort of common features that we identified clusters into these four sort of top-level categories that I described at the beginning. And I'll just pull out a few examples uh, from here. So the most common thing for these things to do is to make things simple uh, and remove distracting features. This is most commonly occurring in the form of browse extensions that do things like remove the newsfeed from Facebook, but interesting Alternatives are things like uh, minimal app launchers for Android, which minimize the amount of functionality available on the home screen of a device. The second most common thing is to uh, block a uh, user's access to distractions. And amongst those, many then further help you help yourself by being unable to be stopped after they've been turned on, or alternatively having some sort of uh, effortful task for you to go complete before you can override uh, a, a blocking. So for example, this is the browse extension Focusly, which requires you to enter a combination of four to six arrow keys in exactly the right order before you can override the blocking and then go on to visit Reddit or Facebook or whatever it might be. Uh, in the case of tools that uh, remind you of your goals, many of them do that in a very concrete form, such as in the form of to-do lists, but others do it sort of slightly more abstractly. Um, many of those do it, that do it in the form of motivational quotes. So for example, this browser extension uh, replaces the content of new tabs with motivational quotes. And now that you've been reminded that you might want to achieve excellence, you might want to ask yourself whether it's aligned uh, with that that you go on to spend more time on Reddit or Facebook or whatever it might be. Now, finally, among the tools that reward you or punish you for how you spend your time, uh, many do that in a quite sort of straightforward gamification way. Uh, but there's also sort of interesting cases of tools that include real-world rewards or punishments, such as taking out money from your bank account if you spent too much time on Facebook, or uh, Pavlok is an actual physical bracelet that can deliver electrical shocks. And it's included here because it uh, comes with a browse extension, so you can program it to automatically give you yourself electrical shocks if you go to particular websites, for example. Brilliant. Uh, now, finally, we also, we also observe that there are some distinct ecosystems uh, between the tools that are available on the different stores. So, uh, um, for example, this thing of being able to remove distracting features within applications or services is by and large something that only occurs on the ex um, among browser extensions because you don't, as an app developer, have the ability to sort of reach into another app and remove particular features, even if, if users might want that. Uh, now, what do we learn by adding a dual systems model of self-control to this picture? Well, in the model that we uh, used, the idea is that our behavior results from two different routes of activation. And one is often called system one control. And this is when our surroundings or our emotional states trigger some automatic habits. So for example, you might also find that you automatically take out your smartphone at any moment of downtime because you've acquired a, a habit of doing so. And now you do it automatically given the right cues. The other route is what people often call system two control, which is when your conscious goals or standards for your own behavior is what trigger you to do certain things. So for example, you might have a goal to text a friend and therefore bring out your smartphone to do so. Now self-control is when you use your conscious system two to override system one when they're in conflict. So for example, you might have a goal of not taking your smartphone or your laptop during a Kai talk and in order to do that, you might have to suppress your automatic checking habits when you're in a talk. Uh, sometimes uh, you fail at doing that. Uh, and uh, neuroscientists uh, think of that in terms of what they call the expected value of control, which is simply like what you expect to benefit from, uh, from controlling yourself in the first place. And that has three different components. Uh, how much reward you stand to gain from it. So if I or to pay you $1 million not to check your phone, to, your phone during this talk, it would be easier for you to actually uh, exercise that control. It also depends on how, on, on how confident you are in your own ability to exercise that control. 
That's what meant with expectancy here. And it also depends on when the delay would occur. So if I tell you, I'm going to give you $1 million to not check your phone during this talk, but I'm going to pay you in 20 years, it's going to have a less forceful impact in helping you control your behavior. At the end of the day, uh, uh, these two routes try to activate different possible patterns of behavior, and what wins out is sort of the behavior that gets the strongest activation. Um, now, when we can re return now to the design features uh, in these tools. Uh, you can find the references for all of this, this for this model in the paper. I forgot to put it on the slide. Um, now, so the tools that are about reminding yourself what your goal is, the spine line is about enabling systems to control by making sure that the goals you want to control your behavior relative to is sort of present in your working memory, because otherwise you can't regulate yourself relative to it. And similarly, the tools that are about uh, self-tracking are largely about raising your awareness of what you do so you can compare that to your standards for how you want to behave. Uh, the tools that are about rewarding and punishing yourself is really about making it easier for you to actually affect that self-control by perhaps adding a reward for doing so, or perhaps there's a browser extension here that allow you to give yourself words of encouragement when you notice that you've managed to not be distracted. Uh, good job. Uh, that is uh, is largely about help, helping you help yourself by increasing your confidence in your own ability to control yourself. And uh, there are also a few tools that try to directly sort of add delay times to loading the distracting functionality, which seems to be about helping you regulate yourself by playing around with our sensitivity to delays. Uh, finally, the tools that are about like, sort of blocking you from accessing Distracting functionality seems to be just blocking unwanted conscious habits from being activated in the first place. And a few tools more sort of constructively try to scaffold new habits, for example, in the case of uh, extensions that redirect you from particular functionality to something else. Um, now, okay, so, so what? So what do we learn from doing this kind of work? Well, I mean, in the first instance, there's use just simply in reviewing what's being explored on this market because uh, we might notice widely used, otherwise theoretically interesting features that we can then go on to study. So, for example, uh, this idea of scaffolding self-control by nurturing some virtual creature is very widely explored, but there hasn't been any uh, HCI research directly exploring uh, whether this is actually is something that, that, that works for people. Uh, many people know the tool Forest on the left, which has more than 5 million users on Android alone. Um, another thing we notice, notice is that some Digital behavior change uh, researchers have suggested that this idea of implementation intentions or setting sort of if-then rules for yourself would be a very good way to affect behavior change. Well, we see exactly this idea actually play out in some of these tools, but we, uh, there, to the best of my knowledge, there hasn't actually been any direct HCI research exploring this in the context of digital self-control, but these tools already exist and we can go out and study if they actually help people. Uh, we also get sort of slightly more philosophical, ethical questions raised. So these tools that uh, increase the friction for people to access distraction raise some interesting questions for us about how far we should go to hold people accountable for their past preferences. That's a really, really tricky uh, question, but we already see different tools exploring this in different ways and toying out with different ideas. And we can sort of go explore uh, how these uh, variations work with people. Uh, we can also, of course, notice design gaps by identifying the dual systems model. So I sort of already mentioned that uh, uh, scaffolding uh, self-control uh, using delays is not that commonly explored. In fact, if we exclude tools that simply display a timer, it's only 4% of tools that directly use sensitivity to delays to, to, to scaffold self-control. This should be somewhat surprising because its sensitivity to delays is directly related to self-control, um, especially in sort of, uh, according to, to uh, behavioral economists. <clears throat> now, in our future work, and we welcome uh, collaborators uh, who have uh, in this space, uh, we are going to explore how, also how using this model might help us uh, think about more sort of personalized interventions, because people are different, uh, and people will differ in the kind of, <clears throat> in the kind of psychological mechanisms uh, that are stronger or weaker with them, uh, which might dictate which people which needs which kind of scaffolding. So we also hope that this kind of, uh, of model will not open, only open up the design space for thinking about different tools more broadly and how they combine, but also perhaps how, how we can tailor it to specific uh, individuals. Uh, so to sum up, um, we think that this sort of market for digital self-control tools gives us this, these like hundreds of natural experiments that can be very, very useful data for us to see what's going on and inspire us to do uh, further research. Um, 
But we also think that applying the dual systems model can actually be very useful for establishing this design space of, uh, of new tools. You find the tools here and all of our data and the paper written in our markdown, because we are doing good open research, uh, is, is on here. Uh, but uh, uh, there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ulrik. So, any questions for Ulrik? Please go to um, to our um, to our uh, student volunteer, Andrew, and state your questions. Hi, um, Alisa, UC Berkeley. Um, all these approaches are conditional on the personal like intrinsic motivation to engage with this sort of tools. So in the first place, you need to recognize the problem that you want to limit the destruction and everything. Do you have any ideas of how to encourage people who don't have the intrinsic motivation and so they don't even search for these kind of tools? What would you do with those? I think that's, it's, it's, it's a bit tricky because, yeah, I mean, so, so we did a recent study where we also asked people about the extent to which they were aware that these kind of tools existed. We found that Many people experience difficulties, but they didn't even they weren't even aware that they could, for example, use browser extensions to remove Facebook's newsfeed if they were struggling with Facebook. Um, so I, th I think, uh, and at the same time, kind of like the efficiency of these tools also depend a lot on how much in control people feel. So if you if you were to just build in these enforce these kind of interventions on people uh, without people feeling that they were in control of having those things. It, it, it matters a lot to how people feel about them. So I think it's, uh, I think there's sort of a, an awareness raising thing that I, I think in the future when we know a bit more about what best practices look like here, I think awareness of these kinds of mechanisms uh, might be, should be something that would be present in, that would, was taught in schools as part of like how to manage your digital life and so on. Because in the first place, people need to be aware of them, but it's important that they themselves actively decide to use them for them to actually to be efficient in the first place and for people to feel sort of ownership uh, over these, these sort of interventions. Hi, uh, Dan Bennett from Bristol Interaction Group. That was uh, really interesting, thanks very much. And it was really interesting to see specifically the dual systems approach applied here. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I keep doing this. Um, really interesting to see the dual systems approach applied here because quite often in HCI we've applied self-determination theory to similar kind of problems. Hmm. So what I was kind of interested in is um, Looking through your presentation there, there seem to be some cases where the two systems might make somewhat different predictions. Mm. So, um, for example, the reward and punish aspect, which um, dual systems look like it would predict as being effective, self-determination theory might predict would be less predictive long term. So I was interested to see whether you thought there were particular reasons for preferring dual systems theory and, um, and any kind of <coughs> gaps that one might cover that the other might uh, miss out. Yeah, I, I think the main... Sorry? I need to minutes. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yes, I'll continue to answer why we switched the computer here. Uh, so I think it's particularly useful because it makes us explicitly think about how our sort of automatic habits and our conscious goals interact. And that's doesn't, and because that's really at the core of what self-control is all about, so that you find yourself automatically having certain impulses and they stop and they, they conflict a bit with what your conscious goals are. So I think it's really useful, therefore, that the, the kind of models we use make us think about that explicitly. And I don't think self-determination theory does that. But even this, this formulation is formulated at a very high level in order to try to make it, make it practically useful. Because you, you could dive into any of the factors there and they would expand to, to, to lots of different individual theories. So for example, I mean, rewards, it also depends so much on how you deliver the reward and is it like a loss or a gain and, and what, what's the timing of it and so on. So each of these mechanisms you could then expand to like a, a separate uh, uh, range of theories uh, as we mentioned in the paper. But, That's yeah. great, thanks very much. Maybe we should chat later.